Trump's top diplomat and the Russian president face to face for the first time, shaking hands while their countries point fingers at each other over Syria. Tonight, meeting in Moscow, how do you measure the truth? I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. This is the day. Everyone's nodding like bobbleheads without analyzing anything that's happening. Where is the proof that the Syrian army used chemical weapons? There is none. The airstrike was on a sovereign country, made without being sanctioned by the UN Security Council. And despite this obvious violation of international law, everyone's fine with it. Everyone accepts it and is nodding in support. Frankly, Putin is backing a person that's truly an evil person. And I think it's very bad for Russia. I think it's very bad for mankind. It's very bad for this world. But when you drop gas or bombs or barrel bombs, they have these massive barrels with dynamite and they drop them right in the middle of a group of people. And in all fairness, you see the same kids, no arms, no legs, no face. This is an animal. Also coming up tonight, a spokesman speaks and history takes a hit. Let the president down. Um, and so on a, both a personal level and a professional level, that would definitely go down as uh, not a very good day in my, my history. Welcome to the program, everyone. We begin the day in Moscow on a mission improbable. When he ran for office, Donald Trump had nothing but praise for Russian President Vladimir Putin. When Trump took office back in January, Russian diplomats celebrated, anticipating a new era of cooperation and trust between Washington and Moscow. Well, tonight, there are no parties in the Russian capital. The U.S. Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, is in town, and he just experienced the Kremlin cold shoulder. I wonder why. In a policy about phase, Washington now says that Syria's President Assad has to go and that Russia has to stop supporting him. And now Putin is accusing the U.S. of even planning toxic gas attacks in Syria to look like the work of Assad. Fake news to justify Trump's true military ambition in the region. How quickly a geopolitical bromance can break up. Here's more from Moscow. What a difference a week makes. Once considered a friend of Russia, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson now finds himself in a tense situation following U.S. airstrikes in Syria. But he held his ground. Clearly, uh, our view is that the reign of the Assad family is coming to an end. And they have, again, brought this on themselves with their conduct of the war these past few years. Uh, we discussed our view that Russia, as their closest ally in the conflict, perhaps has the best means of helping Assad recognize this reality. Moscow may not be so quick to turn on a regime it strongly supports, but Lavrov says whatever comes next is up to the Syrians themselves. On Syria, as our president has stated on many occasions, we are not... trying to, to put our hopes on anyone or on Bashar al-Assad or anyone else, as they do in Libya right now. We want them to sit at one negotiating table. As the UN Security Council resolution states, they have all to gather together. This has to be an inclusive intra-Syrian dialogue. And as the UN Security Council resolution states, the future of Syria has to be determined by the Syrians themselves without any exemptions. These, These comments came after hours of talks. The two top diplomats spoke of being open to dialogue and working together. But Lavrov reiterated the need for a clear stance from the Trump administration. The U.S. airstrikes on a Syrian airbase last week came as a shock to Russia. Washington reassured Moscow that it was a one-off move, mere retaliation for a chemical attack in the country. And though there are other topics of contention like North Korea and allegations of Russian interference in the U.S. election, it is the Syrian issue that is at the center of this very fragile relationship. 
Well, I'm joined now from Washington, D.C. by Jonathan Katz. Jonathan worked at the U.S. State Department during the Obama administration, leading USAID programs across Eastern Europe, including Russia. He's now with the German Marshall Fund. Jonathan, it's good to have you on the show. Welcome. What did we just see tonight in Moscow with Tillerson and Putin? I, I think you described it accurately. Uh, this is an icy relationship. Um, both sides have called this as an all-time low or the lowest it's been in decades. And I think what you saw in Moscow uh, didn't really move the needle forward, but it was necessary to have face-to-face uh, -face and direct communication to ensure that things don't go beyond where they are right now. Well, you know, you can, you can argue that point, but then if you look at what happened in New York this evening, um, it's just the status quo, right? I mean, we had another security resolution, Security Council resolution yeah. on Syria vetoed by Russia. Yeah. Uh, look, it, this has been part of Russia's game for quite some time. When I hear that the uh, that Russian actions in Syria or uh, what they're doing is something that, that shouldn't be condemned or there shouldn't be UN Security Council resolutions moving forward to address what is clearly what has clearly been uh, violations, international violations of law, it's, it's quite damning. So when I hear uh, the foreign minister of Russia talk about the potential for U.S. to have set this up or to claim somehow U.S. is at fault, it's laughable. And you may get that same, you know, chuckling in Russia when we consider what Mr. Tillerson was saying 24 hours ago. I mean, he said 24 hours ago that Assad has to go. And it sounded like all of a sudden the U.S. was talking about regime change in Syria. Is that what we're headed for? Well, this is, um, I, I think this speaks to a, a bigger issue within the, the Trump administration. I call it a Jekyll and Hyde foreign policy, where three days before uh, President Trump was more than willing to look the other way on uh, Assad staying in power, and then three days later uh, takes a completely different position. I think the biggest concern in Washington with respect to the policy, it's not about the response to the use of chemical weapons and what took place, because that was a true tragedy. Um, and, and there should be some sort of response from both the United States and international community. It's about the uh, Jekyll and Hyde approach to foreign policy and then uh, switching policies um, and not having anything behind that. So the question is, is that truly the administration's policies? You mentioned that this was a, a measured response, a one-off. But is that the case? If there's a barrel bomb tomorrow uh, in Aleppo or another Syrian city, what will the U.S. response be? And I think for, for U.S. policymakers here who want to see and want to make sure that Syrian, uh, innocent Syrians uh, impacted by this war are protected, they're concerned that the administration isn't going to be able to back up this initial engagement. What mm -hmm. is the plan? What is the next step? Uh, how are we going to engage Russia in this? Uh, this involves serious diplomacy, something that this administration so far has not been willing to engage in, and this president in particular has been very weak. And if you take Mr. Tillerson at his word that Assad has to go, but also consider the fact that he has not you know, laid out a plan for how that is to happen, it, it sounds very similar to the Barack Obama stance on Syria. I mean, the only element missing really is a red line for President Trump. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's not far off. I think what you're seeing also in terms of both Russia and Syria is a, at least with this new administration, um, he's got some people around him, uh, his new national security advisor, uh, General Mattis, Tillerson, and others who are coming to the reality of what has taken place in Syria and what can actually be done. Uh, but that means that you have to, again, be serious about diplomacy. And that's something the Obama administration was quite serious about. I, I think that, that Trump and his team looked at that uh, in an askance and thought that they could maneuver in a different way. And what's happened is they've come exactly back to where the Obama administration left off. Are, are you surprised that we have been hearing not only uh, U.S. President Trump, but also Mr. Tillerson, members of his cabinet, um, 
they're very eager to bring up the name Obama and lay blame at Obama's doorstep when they talk about the situation in Syria. Yeah, it's um, it's it's been uh, it's been a, a counterpoint for this administration. Every this new administration, the Trump administration, every time uh, something doesn't go their way, uh, they typically point to the previous administration as being responsible uh, for the policy in the region, whether it's foreign policy or domestic policy. And just recall, this over the last three weeks had been uh, probably the lowest point of of this new administration fail, failure in health care. Right. Um, uh, infighting within the administration and all these challenges. And I think uh, one of the things, the immaturity of this administration is not actually taking responsibility for the policies that they undertake uh, and their leadership at this point. Yeah, and you talk about these, these domestic issues, these, these failures for the Trump presidency so far. I mean, what about the yeah. background noise that is still there? I mean, you've got the investigation of Russian meddling into the U.S. election and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to have been lost in translation as we try to decipher what the U.S. policy on Syria is now that there have been these missile attacks. Yes, um, that, that's, that's not in the background. It's actually very much in the forefront here. Um, and uh, there are some who speculate that, that, you know, this type of military action abroad uh, can can sort of wall off some of the challenges on the domestic side. But the investigations continue. Uh, more information today about FISA courts and, and Mr. Carter, part of, uh, of, of his campaign. So it's happening and it's ongoing. And when I think about the, the relationship with Russia um, and Syria being forefront, things have deteriorated, not necessarily because of Syria, uh, but because of the exact investigations that you've talked about meddling in U.S. elections, meddling in elections in Europe, Germany, France, elsewhere. So the challenges with Russia have been longstanding. And so Syria is just the latest in a long line of those challenges. And, and Jonathan, before we let you go, I mean, do you see um, a, a possible positive side effect for Europe out of all of this? I mean, if we're talking about a, a new ice age in relations between the U.S. and Russia, does that mean things are going to improve between Europe and this U.S. administration? Well, just uh, a few minutes ago, we saw the president meeting with the NATO secretary general. Uh, and he's uh, fortunately now he's come to the conclusion that NATO is not obsolete. Um, it's absolutely critical to the national security for the United States and Europe. That is a positive step forward. Uh, the biggest challenge, and I would say that this could be an opportunity for closer relationship uh, with Europe and with our European partners, uh, but the challenge has been that this administration, um, with its Jekyll and Hyde, I call it Jek Jekyll and Hyde foreign policy, you don't quite know what you're getting. And so yeah. the most important thing that they can do right now is continue to coordinate with our European allies. Um, and, you know, nobody's looking for the next Cold War. Uh, but I think it's critical that we all be that 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 we are working together and that the Trump administration move forward and recognize how important the transatlantic partnership is. Jonathan Katz with the German Marshall Fund joining us tonight from Washington, D.C. Jonathan, thank you very much. It's good to have you on the day. We appreciate your insights. Come back. Thank you.